All right. Thanks. My, my name is Muhia Karienjahi. We practiced this this afternoon, and she was awesome. Um, but you get here and you can't see who you're talking to. I understand. <laughs> so um, I uh, work at Honey Rock, uh, and Honey Rock is down on Highway X. Uh, it's a property that altogether is about 800 acres. But the main camp is about 200 acres, um, and, and uh, there are different properties all over, joined by easements. Uh, the idea is to allow campers to be able to hike to different parts of the Northwoods and eventually linked to the Nicolay Forest. So it's like ad infinitum because it's huge out there. Uh, my role at Honey Rock is uh, to coordinate a graduate program. Um, so this is what you're going to find a little different about Honey Rock. It is part of a university. It's part of Wheaton College. And uh, so I'll be talking about how that all comes together. Um, and, uh, but then the other thing that I do, and uh, there's intentionality to this in that I'm here, and I'm a Kenyan, um, is I try to connect Honey Rock to the world and the world to Honey Rock. Um, that, so my role is a global initiatives um, manager as well, right? Let me, let me begin uh, by just talking a little bit about my family. That's a good cue. I was about to start talking about Honey Rock, but I'd get in trouble with my wife. That's my family. Now, we are living up here in the, in the Northwoods, um, and we look a little different, slightly different. But I want to tell you this. The Northwoods Three Lakes has been really hospitable to us. Uh, we came to, from Kenya six years ago, and... Uh, walled away from out there, right? And uh, the weather is a little different, right? Between 60 when, it's, when everybody's out with, you know, their jackets and, and 80 when people are dying of heat. Uh, very, very moderate, highlands, and, um, you know, so everything has been hospitable apart from the weather. I've got to say that, especially just the winters. We don't mind the summers, right? Uh, but we, we really have enjoyed uh, being here. My sons have gone to the local school, and uh, Kema now has gone to Taylor out in Indiana. And one guy is still a senior. I love the way they engage in the community and the way they, too, really, really feel welcome. Marcy, my wife here, um, she works um, at, at the newspaper out in Eagle River and, and, and uh, also teaches uh, subs. We love this place. It's been awesome. Uh, we still don't know how we got here, but we're here and we love it, <laughs> right? So let me talk a little bit about the history of Honey Rock. And um, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you, you find all these interesting stories. And the beginning of Honey Rock is really interesting. Because it begins with some guy who was gambling, a guy from Milwaukee who was gambling. And he won a gamble. And, and he was uh, given a title because the guy he was gambling with didn't have money. And uh, they found uh, that this was a lakefront property uh, right where Honey Rock is. He thought his wife was actually going to be mad at him because he'd been gambling. But his wife was like, ah. And so you know, in 1916, they built a cabin, uh, nice. They wanted it to be a lodge. And uh, apparently, uh, you know, his, his, his Daniel Sh uh, Schwartz, and his wife, Jenny, was an amazing cook. And uh, so this, she's tired cooking and inviting people over, and it became an, an excellent stop for dinner. It became well known in the early um, 20th century as a place to stop over when you're, you're going up and down sh fishing um, along the lakes. And it was called the Deer Lodge at that time. Um, and so they, they lived like that until 1947. That's quite a few years, when a two... Um, camp enthusiasts who had grown up in camps, uh, Daniel Moore and, and, and uh, Truman um, Robertson, uh, they, they bought the property from them as after they retired. And they're the ones who started the name Honey Rock, and it was a youth camp, a camp for youth. Um, they didn't stay there very long because uh, immediately um, this guy from, uh, from Wheaton, from Chicago, um, Hav Krauser, he started... Uh, bringing his his students over now. This was right at the end of the towards the end of the the Second World War, and 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 what this Harv had seen, he was a naval officer, and he had seen the character 
of young people who are in the disciplined forces. And he wanted to see that with his students. And, and he thought a really good way to get his students engaged in, 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 you know, in the disciplines that would give them character would be by giving them an opportunity to be leaders. And so right from the very beginning, Honey Rock was set up to be a place for leadership development. And so he called it, Whitton, it is, right from the beginning, he called it the Wheaton College Summer Leadership School, right? Um, and, and so he, his idea was bring the students up during the summer, let them serve campus, and learn and grow and you know, get responsibility, and, and, and in that way just get a, 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 an opportunity to practice their leadership. Uh, but in a, you know, as, as co the college, Whitton College and Honey Rock continued, and Whitton actually bought it in 1951. And, uh, and then by 1969, professors started bringing their classes up to Honey Rock and they were, you know, they'd bring a short course and they just, students loved being able to go to class and then go out and play in the lake or wherever it was and, uh, and it became a habit and so slowly the, the undergraduate program started growing at Honey Rock and, um, and then in, in uh, 1980, and all this is growing, another big milestone was Honey Rock became the place where freshmen who are about to go to, uh, to college at Wheaton would come for experiential learning. And uh, the, it became a transitional place for them to, um, to just really get ready for college before going to college. So I'm just giving you quick highlights. Of course, a lot of things happened in between, um, you know, all those years. 1996 then, <laughs> Graduate classes start taking place <coughs> at Honey Rock. And, uh, yep, please. <laughs> and um, and, and the, they started doing, uh, thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Right. And they start doing certificate courses, and, um, and by the turn of the century, 2000, they were starting to have graduate programs, and part of the program would be at Honey Rock, and then the part would be out at, at Wheaton College. And then, so this balance started tipping over, or at least becoming balanced. We, we, we said we'd be talking about summer camp. What Honey Rock is primarily is a summer camp, and we try to do that as best as we can, but it's a place where summer camp is opportunity for leadership development. And then the most recent uh, sort of development has been uh, even increasing the school year community is the Vanguard Gap Year. And you'll see how all these come together um, into a leadership, um, outdoor leadership center. Right. So here's a quote from Harv Krauser. Uh, right from the beginning, and you know, we we read this, and we are like, man, this guy had vision uh, in the 40s. While Honey Rock is called a camp, it's essentially an educational project designed to be a leadership lab. So, if you think about a place, you know, a, la a laboratory where people can experience uh, through internships and total leadership immersion as they work with with the cabin group. And here's the deal, because they're practicing their leadership, it's expected of them to provide an excellent, excellent experience for the campus in the summer. And so that's Harv and Dot, um, who are the founders of Honey Rock. So here's the, the mix, once again, of the Outdoor Center for Leadership Development. There's the summer camp, full, fully a summer camp, and then fully also a school year facility with different communities that are there from September until May. And uh, we have a total immersion as you start the summer, total immersion as you begin uh, the school year. So here's, here's principally what we try and do. We have a leadership um, progression, what some people will call a leadership pipeline. And everything that happens at Honey Rock, all the way from <coughs> eight-year-olds eight -year coming for their first camp, um, all the way to graduate programs, is along that uh, chain, uh, pipeline of leadership development. So you're either leading self, you know, you can think of an eight-year-old kid coming over, it's the first time they've been away from mom and dad, 
And uh, for the next few years, they're going to be learning different things about leading themselves. And they'll be working with uh, older kids, um, you know, college students. Um, and for the college students, it's the opportunity to lead others. And, and there are a few steps that are missing here because they'll lead others individually. They're leading counsel their counselors, leading kids, and then they'll they'll get to a place where they lead teams, all right, of other counselors. And uh, they keep going up, and uh, you know, different levels of leading leaders. And at some point, they start leading programs and we uh, would like to send them off to go elsewhere and, and actually lead departments and other, other camp facilities as well. Right. Here's, this, here's a, a picture of the summer camps, um, all the way from, um, you know, way out, I don't know whether you can read this, the intro camp way out to the left is for the little, little ones, and uh, when they're um, in intro camp, they are, um, learning how to lead themselves. And residential camps are a bit longer, going towards a week, two weeks, actually up to three weeks. And, uh, and, and, and they're going out uh, on, on wilderness expeditions. Uh, they're learning to manage one another. They're learning to work as teams. Um, and then when they go into high school, they go to advanced camp, which is a major camp that will happen when they're, when they're going into ninth grade, um, going into 10th grade, between ninth and 10th grade. Um, and, and oh, advanced camp as they're going into ninth grade, 222 when they're in high school, and then there's a series of other camps that are right there that are summer camps, Venture, um, and there's uh, Vanga, Voyager, and uh, other opportunities where they move from just leading themselves, They'll, you know, there's some of the, pro uh, the, the programs, they're just, they're, they're, they do their own program design. What are they going to be doing for the next two weeks? And where will they be going? And they get to plan their food and stuff like that. Um, and then if they do come back the following year, they learn to serve others. And for seven weeks, they're, they're, they're keeping camp clean, they're cleaning up, they're, they're working with the work crews, you know, um, maintaining buildings, stuff like that, and learning the act of service and, and growing their leadership through service. And sort of the apex high school experience is when they become assistant counselors and they actually lead other kids. Now, we have had the privilege of watching our kids go through that and just seeing how they turn after seven weeks of serving or nine weeks of being assistant counselors, and, uh, and they come home and they are totally different, right? Then, and uh, so the big thing to notice about all this is, is a progression. And a kid can begin <coughs> coming to Honey Rock when they're eight years old and right through high school, and there's some who have done that. And then when they're done with high school, they can actually come back and be part of the Vanguard Gap Year program. And uh, the purpose of the Vanguard Gap Year program is to prepare them for college. Well, not just college, because some students have come in and uh, spent a year discerning and trying to, um, to, to, to determine what their vocation, what, what their calling is. And some decided, you know, maybe it's not, it's not university. Maybe I'm supposed to go to a trade school because I'm really, really good uh, with, in this particular trade or the other. And so it's really a, a, an opportunity for discernment. And you can see how there's an advantage to kids going to school, to college, when they've already thought through this uh, so that they don't waste their first year of their parents' money, uh, you know, discerning this very expensively. Right? Um, so this is a program that starts in September, ends in May. Lots of opportunity to serve. Um, they get to, to work with professors and, and, uh, and, and see the inside of a university classroom. And they actually get credit. And they get to travel internationally, um, usually to, to the Caribbean, um, you know, one of the countries out there, and, and do service out there, have a cross-cultural experience. Right now, uh, they are in Chicago, serving in, uh, in, in parts of southern Chicago and learning uh, the, the cultural dynamics in, in that place. And then, and then they'll come back and continue to serve. Many of them then start serving um, immediately in summer camp as leaders. Right? And then after that transition, then we begin what we call the summer leadership schools. These are university students who are counselors, uh, 
team leaders of counselors, um, and, and, and they, they can earn certificates, uh, that they can earn college credit by doing that. And, and several students will, will keep coming, all the way from eight years old, and right through four years of college, they'll be coming over and serving in different, in different roles. And an interesting piece of the summer is uh, global <laughs> impact. We invite summer leaders from all over the world and they'll come in and they'll join in with, the, with college students, not just from Wheaton, incidentally, from all over the US. And it's a most enriching um, experience because they are learning all this camp craft that you know, the US has to offer, but then the summer crew that's here is learning about these countries and learning values and learning, and learning about countries that they, they didn't have um, any ideas about, and we get to live very closely with, with people. We have folks in this picture from everywhere, from South Africa to, to Korea to Haiti, um, and we try and get more and more to come in and go through that process as well. And, uh, you know, the, I, I have uh, just had the joy of watching uh, on, on, on the days that parents come to pick their kids, little children, you know, just talking about this person from, you know, from Sierra Leone, and that's all they're talking about because it's so cool. And so everybody's winning, right? And after college, then they can, uh, if they're not sure what they want to do after college, there's another transitional year um, that's uh, for, for discerning which way forward, right? I like that little trail uh, with, a, with a foggy background. Where are you going? Um, we call them Honey Rock Fellows. Their, responsi their main responsibility is actually to work with the vanguards, gap year vanguard students who are between high school and, and, and college, and, um, and, 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 and they're, they're hands-on, supervising them as they work in different parts of the camp, all part of leadership development. And then I would say that the apex, the uh, final sort of stages of leadership development is the graduate program, uh, which I have the privilege of being part of. These students come work for two years. Each graduate student is a graduate assistant, and they are absolutely responsible for a whole program, one of those programs. Now, there's very close supervision. Uh, they work with permanent staff who are professionals, and, um, and, and, and they, they, what the questions that they have when they're working, they bring to the classroom, and in the classroom, they're innovating and bringing back new ideas into, into their camps. Um, it's a really um, awesome sort of, sort of happens. Um, a few things about the people they work with. They're working with permanent staff, and every single permanent staff uh, at Honey Rock is very attuned to the leadership progression thing. Um, if you are uh, working as a maintenance guy, you, many of you know uh, George Polcaster. He loves construction. That's what he loves. But in his other life, he was a pastor and he loves working with people. And so this was the perfect coming together of two things that he's passionate about. Um, and he's able to develop people, walk alongside people as they're learning how to do the craft of, of, of building or maintenance. And, um, and the students get to be in the middle of that. So that, you know, I thought in a nutshell, I would, I would just sort of give the big picture of what we're doing down uh, on Highway X. Um, and that is it. I want to open up to opportunity for questions that you may have about Honey Rock. Right? I can't see any hands. <laughs> I can come. Yeah. Yeah, there, there is a mix, there are different arrangements. Yes, these are paying students. Um, the graduate students obviously have to play, pay tuition, um, and, and the arrangement is kind of good because they pay tuition for their studies, um, they pay for room and board, but they're earning as they're working, so they're getting paid. And uh, we actually do not uh, tell them, okay, you work and we'll reduce the cost of this. We, they get paid, and they have to manage their money, and, you know, and, and it's quite a journey for some of them. And some are better than others in how to manage their money. Fellows, there is a bit more of a balance. Um, they too get paid, but they, they, you know, they also have room and board, and they take some classes as well because they're they're considering um, graduate studies. Uh, so there's a bit, there's a lot of exchange. 
Um, about the gap year students, they do pay, but it's a very uh, creative uh, program that they have. Uh, like they, 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 they're, they're matching scholarships if they have earned the money themselves, right? Uh, they can work the summer after they uh, have been at Tandy Rock for, a, for, for their school year, and they can continue paying uh, for the program that, that's already happened. So we try and make it affordable for people. All right. Now I can see hands. There. <laughs> so this is where their blood lines, right? Because everybody who's there over the school year is tough, <laughs> right? And uh, during the school year, including the gap year students, because they're working as well. Um, during the school year, we have a community of about 45 to 50, and that's growing as the different programs grow. As soon as summer begins, that number goes up to 250 uh, seasonal staff coming in. Um, of the 45, I would say about 15-ish are permanent staff or um, you know, maybe part-time staff who are not also part of the programs. You know? um, I don't know whether that answers your, your question about numbers. Yeah. All right. So one of the have Krauser terms is a place apart. And uh, we see our facility as a place apart, away from the distractions of, of a lot of stuff, right? Um, maybe about five years ago, six years ago, we would have said absolutely no cell phones, right? Um, but as life has changed, and uh, a lot of what we do depends on, on, on having instant communication, our policy has changed to where we very creatively get people to think about how they use their their cell phones and their computers and any, anything else. Uh, so yeah, we, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly um, gadget-free facility, apart from places like the office. When some programs begin, uh, like the Vanguards, begin with like six or eight weeks, I think, of a fast, total technology fast. And uh, they go through the, you know, the shakes, and they eventually learn that you can go out and play, and 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 then and re get to reflect on their experience and how has it been to be free from social media, um, and now as you're re-entering freedom to use this and to use it resp responsibly, what's going to be different? And and then when they're free to use their gadgets, and and throughout the summer, there are only certain places where you can actually have your phone. Um, if you're in, in, in places where there are other people, uh, it is expected that you're actually engaging with others and not, and not on your phone hiding by yourself. If you're watching a movie in those rare moments, you know, that you're allowed to, you're not doing it alone. You're doing it in community because community is pretty important. Uh, so, yeah, the lines are not as, as hard as, as, as one would expect uh, because when you build solid boundaries, people just learn how to go around them. It's much better to get people to think of what are we trying to attain, what goals are we going for. That's a vague answer, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. And then I'll go right back after. Yes, ma'am. All right, this I think is uh, almost countrywide. More girls are going to camp than guys. It seems to be happening. Uh, and uh, there's lots of studies that are being done on where are the boys? Why don't the boys want to go and experience camp? Um, so I don't know the exact ratio, but I do know that I'll typically have more female students um, and fewer guys. Yeah, you know, America, we need to <laughs> check on our guys <laughs> and manhood and, and, and uh, getting them to places like, like um, summer camps, and lead, especially in leadership positions. All right, right back there.
Awesome. Yes, that happens a lot. And having been there from 1951, you know, we get gr a lot of the kids actually uh, uh, come to Honey Rock um, sponsored by their grandparents. <laughs> yes, because they had that experience and, and they really want to see their kids go through that. Um, we have opportunities for uh, people who have been to Honey Rock to come, um, you know, and, and, and stay in our cabins. We have... Uh, one week in the fall uh, that, that, that a lot of older people come uh, for a week of camp and they play, you know? <laughs> they really play and everybody loves it because they have all sorts of stories. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things we really enjoy is having a long heritage uh, and having people come back and also actually support the camp financially and in other ways, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I saw your husband at Henry Rock today. <laughs> Excellent, yes. All right. You'll tell me when it's time to hand over. All right. Yes, ma'am. The camp is owned by Wheaton College, and it's an accredited college facility as well. Um, fully owned by Wheaton College, but we try and, and live as a self you know, we try to be self-sustaining so that Wheaton is not sending money over. And it's part of the challenge of, of, uh, of leadership development. You want um, entities that, are, that, that can support themselves. Uh, so we do quite a bit, and we may look independent, but we are totally under the, the, the oversight of Wheaton College. We belong to one of the schools uh, at Wheaton College, the School of Mission, Ministry, and Leadership. And so we have our own dean and, and all of that. Um, one of the other things that's unique about Honey Rock then is it's also a facility for developing faculty. Faculty love to come and be part of some of the programs and learn how to teach experientially and uh, just to, you know, let loose a little bit <laughs> and, and, and play. Um, and uh, in some of the orientation programs, they'll, they'll come and work with the, the incoming freshmen. And when the, the, the incoming students then go to Wheaton, they already know a faculty member really well. So there's a lot of interaction that, that goes on between the two. And we have some of our staff that actually live and work at Wheaton College and advocate for us and do things like marketing, you know, with, a, with, a, with the benefit of a larger marketing department and so on. All right. Well, thank you very much. I need to stand in the light. I know that, so we'll do that. Uh, and so uh, it, it's a real blessing for me to serve as the executive director there. And uh, my family and I have uh, uh, been here for a number of years. My wife's name is Debbie, and we raised two children, Becca and Andrew. Both went through the Three Lakes School District, and uh, we love Three Lakes. And so they love coming home and visiting, both married now, so uh, it's a great place. I noticed some of you went to summer camp as children. And I bet uh, there's something you remember about that. Because everyone I talked to, and I saw somebody just this last weekend who came to Camp Luther in 1947, and he had to tell me all about it. And the, people never forget their time at camp for some reason. It has a major impact on their lives and great memories that they share there. And so um, I, too, have memories of Camp Luther. I came here as a boy, and one of the traditions was always hiking to the Dairy Queen. And so the whole camp hiked in on Tuesdays to have lunch at, in the park, and then everybody got to go to the Dairy Queen, not all at once, but uh, we all did. And so even today when I'm around Three Lakes, I, I see spots, remember things from when I was a child 
uh, here in Three Lakes. And it, it's really a, a neat thing, and we feel very blessed to be a part of this community today. And so um, I'll talk and share about what Camp Luther is all about today with you and uh, who we are and what we do and a bit of the history and how it connects to Three Lakes. Uh, we are the camp of the North Wisconsin District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And I'll give you a little bit of information about what that is all about. Uh, uh, the North Wisconsin District is a district of our church. And that district is um, the northern part of Wisconsin from Highway 10 and north, and then much of the UP of Michigan. And within that district, within that area, is about 220 Lutheran congregations. And those are the, that's the primary uh, purpose of the camp in serving them, especially originally as the camp was developed. Uh, there are three main uh, Lutheran church bodies in the United States, and the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod is the second largest of those with about 6,000 congregations about, uh, across the country. And so uh, that's what our church body is. Um, so we're definitely a denominational camp and started as a denominational camp, and that's our main purpose in serving that, but we serve a lot of other people. And one question I can answer right now is you don't have to be Lutheran to come to Camp Luther. And we want people to know that, and we welcome um, all kinds of folks and groups and people to come and utilize the camp today. Our values at Camp Luther, you can see there, and they all stem from our belief and our faith in Jesus Christ, which is what Camp Luther is all about. And so uh, our camp is primarily a camp that provides support and encouragement to people in so many different ways uh, in the activities and programs that take place at the camp, a place apart, as was mentioned, and a place of rest and recuperation and a time away where people can uh, reconnect uh, to their God and his word and to his creation. And that's what Camp Luther is all about. It's also a place of growth and training and leadership that takes place for so many people. Uh, for many people, their camp experience has been a life-changing event. Uh, if I would add one more of our values there, uh, if I could right now, it would be fun also, because that's really important to us, that everything that takes place at camp is fun, uh, and we, we work very hard at making it fun, uh, but it's all with a purpose, and it all revolves, revolves around our mission of building people up in Christ uh, through their experiences at Camp Luther. So where are we? Uh, but many of you know where Camp Luther is. It's a little bit easier to get to than Honey Rock, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, but we love where we're at. Um, so here's Highway 45, and this is Cy Williams Road, and there is Camp Luther. So very easy to get to from Highway 45. And of course, all the access to the chain and to Three Lakes has been great for us also. Our property line runs along the north right here, including this small little lake we call Mirror Lake. And then we have property all the way to the channel here that connects uh, Town Line with uh, Planning Ground Lake. And that runs here. And then our other property line goes about like this. And then we have this entire shoreline of uh, Range Line Lake. And then we also have property around, along Brager Road also in this direction and across to the channel here. So uh, we are very blessed with the property that we have at camp and uh, enjoy uh, many different environments that we have, including that bog, which is Mirror Lake, and a pine forest, and a hardwood forest, and many different things there. And uh, we're blessed with great neighbors uh, who uh, uh, don't uh, mind our singing in the evening, and our campfires, and all those things that take place, and some of the craziness that happens there also. And what a blessing to be on the chain of lakes and all that it offers uh, to Camp Luther people and the people of Three Lakes. So we have a little, I think it's an interesting uh, history. Uh, when my daughter Becca was about third grade, she visited the library and came home with a book called Pine, The Pine, the Plow, and the Pioneer. <laughs> and guess what I found in there? I found Camp Luther in that book. And so uh, uh, that was very exciting to see some pictures of the camp. And so uh, this property um, was first owned as a farm by a gentleman named James Nelson in about 1900. And then uh, the property then was purchased by two friends who happened to be professional baseball players. Their names were Cy Williams and Fred Luderas. Uh, both played for the Phillies and both played for the Cubs. So I'm imagining they were very good friends and went on in uh, uh, this as many other ventures in Three Lakes, of course, that they had also. But uh, they purchased this property in about 1920 and they created, it was called the High Mount Resort at the time. And if you look really closely in this picture, you can't see it, but there's a truck there or a car would be a model 
A or T or something. I'm not sure what that is, but it uh, gives a little bit of the idea of when that is. So it's a great history of the camp. Uh, there, uh, uh, with that history, there at the time they had a still across the kitty corner from Camp Luther on the corner of Bray Williams and Cy Williams there where they had a home brew, I guess, that served the camp, uh, the, the lodge at the time. And uh, portions of the property burned in the 1920s. There was a forest fire after a tornado in a previous summer, and that fire swept all the way from south side of Three Lakes all the way to Planting Ground Lake. And I hike around the Camp Luther property sometimes, and I can still find stumps uh, from that fire on that property. So that's quite interesting. In 1926, uh, Camp Luther was, or this property, was the site for the Northwoods Winter Carnival. And uh, there's some pictures in this book you can see. And uh, they had cars with skis on them. They had a big toboggan run. They had an ice skating rink on Rangeline Lake. And uh, uh, they also had a ski jump. Uh, all right on the shores, right by camp, right at Camp Luther is today. Uh, later, I think that turned, uh, became uh, the site, the Northern Air took over that uh, event, I think, and a few years after that. Also on our property uh, on Halverson Road, there was horse trails on both sides of that that were used by um, uh, the resort and other, uh, others in the area. So uh, unfortunately, uh, Fred and Cy went bankrupt uh, with the uh, uh, Highmount Resort, and it was purchased by another family called the Roth family, and it became known as the Rothmore Lodge. They also went bankrupt. <laughs> And uh, that's when the North Wisconsin District purchased the property in 1946. So we're hoping we're not next when it uh, comes to that. So they searched all over northern Wisconsin for a place to call their own camp. They had been renting facilities for a number of years. And they found uh, 91 acres just north of Three Lakes, Wisconsin. And there was a lodge and four cottages uh, on the shore of Rangeline Lake there. So how much do you think they paid? 1946. A good guess, $22,000 for 91 acres. So what a deal that was at the time. And so uh, Camp Luther was a traditional summer camp in those early years, as well as a place for families to gather in the cottages that they had at the time. And uh, a lot of traditions uh, took place. Uh, there's a PBS uh, special that was out a couple years ago that talked about the camps that started in northern Wisconsin in the 1920s and the 30s, and especially in the 1940s, at the end of World War II, uh, when families were starting again, and people wanted camps where their children and where they could attend as families. And so many camps uh, in our North Woods here and other parts of Wisconsin developed at that time. And many of the traditions that these gentlemen brought home, and women, uh, from service became part of the camps as they developed. And we still saw some of those at Camp Luther today, such as flag raising and flag lowering. Uh, canteen, we have a place called the Canteen still at Camp Luther where uh, we buy food and uh, 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 souvenirs and things like that. Uh, army blankets were used and still are sometimes. And when I was a camper at Camp Luther, our camper group was called a patrol at the time. And even the schedule of camp, and some camps even had uniforms, which uh, stemmed from a uh, relationship with military service and things like that also. And so uh, that's how a lot of camps developed, and a lot of traditions of camp came from that in some cases. Our camp continued to grow then uh, in the 1970s and 80s especially. Uh, in about 1972, the first full-time director was hired at Camp Luther and other full-time staff were put into place, and then we saw the growth of the camp take place in, in uh, um, great ways during that time. Um, uh, in the 1980s, we started something at Camp Luther called Villages, and these are very uh, important part of what Camp Luther is today. Uh, in the woods, uh, about a quarter mile from the main part of the camp, are five different villages where summer camps can stay. And these started in the 1970s and 80s when counselors and others had ideas uh, for creating unique and special places where campers could stay in the summertime. So the first of those was a teepee village, then they built log cabins, uh, we had mash tents, and today we have five different villages in the woods also where uh, campers can come and stay in a unique setting for their time at camp. Uh, also during that time we added year-round programming, uh, more cottages were built and more villages were added uh, to become much like Camp Luther is today. 
So today we host a, a, just a, a plethora of year-round retreats uh, for groups that can um, uh, rent our facility for their own program that they might have. And then we have a number of uh, programs where groups come and participate in the program as a group along with other groups. So on our winter weekends, for example, in January, uh, we might have 120 to 150 youth there that are all come from different churches but are all participating in the same program together. Uh, summer camps, uh, and then our cottage is at Camp Luther, that dot uh, uh, range line lake, and more than 6,000 people visit Camp Luther each year participating in our programs. Uh, last year, we had uh, summer campers from more than 20, 24 different states that came to camp. Uh, there's a picture of uh, Treehouse Village, or Tower Village, and uh, we have a Tower Village and a Treehouse Pioneer, uh, one called Noah's Ark and one called uh, Fort Village. And so those are the most popular places for campers to stay. When they register, they can choose to stay in one of these special places for their time at camp. Uh, we offer programs uh, in the summer uh, for uh, children beginning at kindergarten and preschool. Uh, they can come to a weekend camp called Kinder Camp with one of their parents, or on other weekends, they can come with one of, their, one of their grandparents for that weekend also. It was a very special experience and fills every summer because grandparents love that time with grandchildren that they often don't get. We also have weekend programs for grades 1, 2, and 3 where they stay just for three days. And then beginning at grade 3, they can come to our five-day camps, uh, which run uh, through 8th grade and all the way through high school. Uh, about 16 to 1,700 children participate in our overnight camps each summer. Uh, we also have off-site adventures and programming that's around, that are, uh, has to do with that, as well as leadership camps and opportunities for, to serve. Uh, we have a number of uh, servings really important to us, so a lot of the programs have uh, service intertwined into that, and there's a, some, some camps especially designed uh, for students uh, to, to grow in service in different ways to others. Uh, we also offered a camp for the first time this past summer, a day camp program uh, down near Green Bay, which is specifically for children of Hispanic uh, migrant families living in that area. And we're really excited about that development to do some mission work in that community. And then this summer, we have some students coming to the, for the first time from Kazakhstan to Camp Luther. And we're excited them to help see what Camp Luther is all about also. Uh, in the small picture, you can see a little bit picture of our cottages there uh, along Camp Luther. We have 15 of those for families, and this is quite the tradition. Uh, uh, we have families that have literally become, been coming for more than 50 years to the same cottage. Uh, and uh, that's a wonderful tradition for them. Uh, and if you book your cottage before you leave, you get your cottage next year. So that's how it works at camp. They say they're harder to get than Packer tickets is the... Uh, <laughs> Thing that is said quite often. Uh, there are two and three bedroom cottages with kitchens and we provide a program for people in the summer with staff. So there's a family program going on. They just love the atmosphere and the environment and the safety that they feel in that place, uh, knowing that their children are being taken cared for by staff and families can relax and spend time together. And many of them just develop relationships with one another so that this little, this little uh, cottage lane that we have kind of becomes their main street for this one week of the year where they know everybody on the street. And uh, it's a real, real lovely, uh, beautiful thing, I guess, for them to share in that together. Uh, many of these families are from Illinois. Uh, back in the 19, early 50s, uh, some promotion took place from there, and many of those families are still coming today because their families first came uh, in the 1950s. So that's a wonderful program. Uh, we have a waiting list that we have to manage for cottages, and there's over, over 300 names on that waiting list. So that's, if we could, yeah. <laughs> we need to do something about that, so we will. Um, we're also excited about a, a new developing camp that we have near Houghton, Michigan called Keweenaw Base Camp. And uh, it's about two hours north of here. It's not the edge of the world, but you can see it from there. That's what I heard. Uh, so it's quite a ways up. It's a beautiful part of the country. And uh, we're able to develop a new camp in this area, which is uh, uh, specifically focused on programming for teens and young adults uh, with an emphasis on leadership and service and faith development there while they're there. Uh, people can come as groups, and we also have programs for individuals where they can come to uh, Keweenaw Base Camp. We call it KBC uh, in the summertime. Uh, this comes as a gift to Camp Luther. Uh, there's a gentleman that purchased 220 acres there and said, would you like to start a camp? 
We said, sure, but we don't have any money. And he said, well, I'll pay for that too. So uh, they're developing the camp for us and building facilities and uh, creating a new ministry there for us uh, in the Keweenaw. So it's a wonderful gift, and uh, we're working to make uh, use of that. It's been operating for about five years now uh, as a summer camp program. We also have four beautiful cabins that are available there for a uh, little advertisement, are little, available there for rental uh, year-round, two brand new cabins which are beautiful, and two other facilities that are renovated very nicely also. So uh, you can look for uh, uh, Keweenaw Base Camp online and uh, see those facilities. If you'd like to rent one of those, you're welcome to do that. Our staff, a uh, very important part of what takes place at camp is the staff and how they are developed and, and uh, how they serve the needs of our guests and, and serve the mission of the camp. And so uh, here's a picture of our summer staff. Uh, each year we hire about 50 college-age students that serve at the camp. Everyone drives their own car, I believe. So that's a problem. Uh, <laughs> they come to us um, from a number of private and state schools across the country. Uh, we do recruit heavily. There's a Concordia University system. If you've heard of uh, Concordia University, Wisconsin, uh, that's, a, that's a university that's connected to the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. So uh, a great deal of our staff comes from that university as well as other Concordias. But also about half of them are from state schools across the state and others who perhaps uh, either learned about Camp Luther or came to Camp Luther as a child themselves. So uh, this is really a leadership development program for us. They are employees, they do get paid, but we have a much greater mission for them than just uh, taking from them and saying goodbye to them at the end of the summer. Uh, we want them to develop as leaders uh, through their service at camp, and so uh, we really view this as a program and opportunities for them to develop. We also have 14 year-round staff at Camp Luther, both full-time and part-time in those roles, and uh, wonderful folks that are very dedicated and we're really thankful for them and all that they do uh, uh, for camp in our mission. Volunteers are really important at camp, and more than 300 people serve as volunteers each, uh, each year at Camp Luther, many of them in maintenance and improvements and cutting firewood and things like that, but there's also pastors and ministry leaders, there's summer medics, and many other people that uh, volunteer in different ways. And this is really how this camp was built, was through volunteers that came up and built the camp into much of what it is today. Uh, as well as when it was simply a summer-only facility, uh, they were in charge of opening up the camp in the summer and closing it uh, when the fall came each year also. So we love volunteers, and it's, it's a harder in today's world to get volunteers, uh, but it's so exciting when they do and to see the buy-in um, and to know that their hands had, a, had a, played a part in what is taking place at camp uh, gives them a great deal of satisfaction. They love to come back and say, I helped build that, or I had something to do with that, and they take a lot of pride in that, and that's a great ministry that takes place in that. So we're looking towards the future now at Camp Luther, and uh, we have some big plans coming up in the very near future. So announcing uh, the new Camp Luther dining facility. So um, uh, this will be breaking ground this September for this new facility on uh, shores of Range Line Lake. And uh, this will replace that old lodge and dining hall, which is original to the camp. And um, it's going to more than double the seating capacity that we have uh, for meals. And it'll be a great addition to the camp and really set the stage for the next 75 years of the camp and its history. Uh, there'll be expanded meeting rooms and space, as well as a coffee shop that we're planning in this facility. So we're waiting for approval from Oneida County which we sure will come. We also have another project coming up uh, later this month. Uh, we have about 40 volunteers coming to build an, uh, a new village. We're replacing our fort village, and so here's an artistic rendering of what that's going to look like. Uh, so in five days, uh, with a construction company as, as the lead volunteers and other volunteers, we're going to try to build this village in, in uh, five days on site at camp. So really looking forward to that project, too. So. Uh, and that's a neat, can you imagine campers, children having a chance to sleep in there and stay there overnight? Uh, it's very exciting and very fun for them, so we love that. And we love Three Lakes, and so uh, we just want to invite you to come out sometime and visit if you'd like to do that. I'd love to give you a tour or show you around. 
Um, I don't recommend either Fridays or Sundays in the summertime. These are the drop-off and pick-up days. And there's nowhere to be, so uh, don't do that. But come out any time. We'd love to show you around, and you can see what Camp Luther is about up close. We also have day camps for local children and children that attend camp from our local communities and Eagle River and Rhinelander. Uh, it's a great place for a group outing, and especially with our new facility, we're looking forward to the opportunity to host banquets and other types of events and things that can take place at camp also. So. Questions? I didn't. I should have. <laughs> You're welcome to stop by anytime. Yep, please do. Yes? Yes, that's important. Uh, and we're replacing a building, which is our main place of eating, so it's quite complicated. We're going to have to feed people in, in our, our retreat center building during that time, uh, during construction. So they, they're going to begin in September, and they've promised to have it done uh, by May 15th. <laughs> I don't want to hear any stories either. <laughs> So we're looking, really looking forward to that. Uh, we had one time thought about building in a different location just because of the problem of staying open and still offering food service during construction. But in the end, we decided we wanted, we wanted to be on the lake again with a dining facility. So, Any other questions? Well, that's a good question. Uh, we haven't decided that yet. It, um, uh, I think there's going to be people calling, so we're going to have to figure that out. Yes. <laughs> um, there's been a beer or two drinking, drank at Camp Luther um, <laughs> over the years, but uh, we do not have that. But um, what happens with that if a group uses the facility for that purpose? They need to have their own. Yes, with a, with a server and so forth. Yes, but we haven't said yes to weddings yet. So uh, uh, we're not opposed to that, except it's very complicated to fit into the schedule of the camp and utilizing the spaces when they're needed for the programs that already exist. Everyone wants to be there in July, and that's just not a good time for us. So what did you feel about the Oh, I loved that question, Who, wherever that came from. That, yes. Uh, so I, I love the, the Mo's explanation there, too. And it is about educating people uh, about the value of setting that aside and being present with the people you're with and not present with the people you're not present with. And so uh, we spend a lot of time educating our staff, number one, on that, and uh, so that they um, put their cell phones aside um, when they're working with people. And uh, there are appropriate times to have those out and so forth. So staff is one battle to begin with. And then the second battle is with campers from the youngest on up now come with their own phones. Uh, but we do take those away and return them on their day that they leave. Uh, and parents know that that's going to happen. But it's, it's, a, it's a tough battle today. What is your, um, what is your yeah. Um, Mo's another good comment by Mo on that because that, that is a problem. Um, on a good week, it's probably 60, 40 percent for us. On a bad week, it can be 80 to 20. And the older they get, the fewer the boys also is what I would say about that. So I've written articles on that and trying to encourage people to send your, send your children, send your boys, uh, send your grandchildren to camp, those boys also. Uh, we, we're doing fine with that. We do, do well with that. But we need less boy counselors because there's less boy campers. So uh, it kind of fits maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Really great to be with you tonight. Thank you.